Well, good morning, folks. How are we all doing today? I see people in the chat saying hello, so that's fantastic. Um, at least one, uh, at least one excellent use of emoji reactions. We've got uh, a snowman and a snowflake and all kinds of things. That's that's lots of fun. And I see someone saying, uh, "All right, hustlers, let's get this bread." Okay, let's do it. Let's get some bread. Um, all right. Sorry, at this point you might be saying, no, no, no. Dr. Anderson, you are far too old to be saying things that were popularized in 2018, but oh well. What are you going to do? Uh, so yes, it's fantastic to see folks, and I have just posted a question in Top Hat. So while we're all signing in and getting set and stuff, uh, we can start answering that question. In the meantime, I'm going to make an announcement about assignment two. So last time I said, oops, it looks like I may have made a mistake in the auto grader. Well, it looks like I made a mistake by saying I made a mistake, because I actually didn't. It turns out that the all the Unicode stuff around green boxes and gray boxes and all that stuff completely fine because the comparison that Python was doing between your string that had Unicode characters in it and my string that had Unicode characters in it, completely fine. The issue that I've been talking about different ways to represent it, that only matters when you convert it to bytes. And that's not what we we're doing. We were comparing Python strings, and so everything is completely fine. Um, the issue for a bunch of people was that although you were printing out after each word, hey, here's the response to this word. You got some characters right, some wrong, so we'll print out like a gray, yellow, green, gray, gray, or something like that. And then the next word is a little bit closer, so we'll print out some response characters. The issue for a bunch of people is that you didn't do the thing at the end end of the assignment, which is to print out a summary of how the whole game went. And that caught a bunch of people. And then it slightly surprised you because the auto grader said something like, you didn't print out gray, yellow, green, gray, gray. And you say, yes, I did. Ah, but the thing is you were supposed to print it out right away, but then also print it out at the end as a summary. So if I pull up that assignments page, You'll see here, uh, well, in the overall description, you're going to give feedback, 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 and then at the end, you give a summary that says, here are, here's the feedback on all the guesses you made, and this is the thing that someone would actually post to a text message or tweet it or whatever. Uh, there's more detail here under the objective section as well, but it's kind of saying the same thing. So at the end of the game, you're also supposed to print a summary. That wasn't super clear in the feedback the auto grader because it gave you because it just said things like I looked for this string and I didn't find it and well you would have found that string. I've updated the auto grader not to fix anything that was wrong because it turns out it wasn't wrong but to give more detail and more information. So now it says things like it's player one's turn. I'm looking for this string and I found it. I'm looking for this string and I found it. Okay now it's player two's turn. I'm looking for this and I found it etc. Then at the end all right now let's see a summary and then it might say something like hey I didn't find this string that I was supposed to find and it's a little bit clearer that it didn't find it in the summary summary as opposed to up above. So I've added more detail to the auto grader to be a little bit clearer about why there are some incorrect answers. Um, if you look at your score and you say, oh, well, I was, and, and actually I changed it to be a little permissive too on the, uh, the input or on the prompt thing, um, so there, or rather in requiring the summary. So for some people, you previously had a grade of like 12 out of 20, and now it's more like 14 or maybe even 15 out of 20. But still, if you say, oh, if all I need to do is output that summary at the end, I can change my code to do that. I'll give you an opportunity to do so. So right now, submission is still open. So I earlier in the week, I said I'd create a late submission queue and just kind of not apply the late penalty. That is still open until six o'clock today. Um, but if anybody really needs a little bit of extra time because this has changed something for you, then do let me know and I'll see what we can do. Um, at least one student was sick this week and so they emailed me and so I created an extension just for them and that's completely fine. So if today is not enough time because of the announcements that I made over the past couple of lectures, let me know. Okay. Uh, so we've got lots of answers to this question. Let's take a peek at what people said. So I'll close that question out and take a look at the responses. Okay, and almost everybody said 20. So we will 
Yes. We will reload that in Thani. We will take a look at what happens when we run this program in Thani. So let us debug this and step through one bit at a time. So first, we're creating a variable called x. Now, is this a local variable inside of a function or a global variable? Go ahead and just type that in the chat. While you're doing that, I'm gonna continue stepping along here. So we uh, define a function called foo. And so now you can see we have a variable called x and a function called foo. And now we are going to modify that. Ah, good, in the chat, I see people are saying global. That's right. So this variable, right here that is not local to any particular function that is a global variable for this whole script this other x here that's going to be a local variable once we call the function foo so we're stepping through we have initialized x with a value of zero we have defined a function now we're going to modify the value of x now we're going to call the foo function so let's see what happens well uh, we're calling foo of x plus 1. What's x plus 1? Let's not try to keep everything in our heads. Let's look at what's written down in the computer's memory. x is 1. So x is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. So we're going to call foo of 2. So we're going to take the number 2 and pass it as an argument into the foo function, where it will be received as an initializer for that x parameter. So you can think of an argument as something that you throw and a parameter is something that catches. Or as we use the analogy before, an argument is like a value or is it like a thing that you put into a machine slot and a parameter is like the slot that you put something into. If you have a machine that is going to do some processing on a piece of bread to toast it, for example. So now we're inside the foo function. We have a parameter called x and it is has the value 2. So uh, we are going to return 10 times x. So let's figure out what the value of x is. In order to figure out the, what the value of x is, and this is, see how it's starting to get to a point where um, it could start to get complicated to keep, well, what is x in your head all the time? Because now we even have more than one x that we need to keep track of. So we've got the global x and we've got the local x. Well, we're inside this function. Uh, we're inside this function invocation, inside this function call. So we're going to use that local X. And we can see here in the box, its value is 2. So 10 times 2 is 20. We return 20. And that is the value that gets stored in Y. Then we modify this global variable called X. And you notice the local X is just gone. It was something that only existed for the lifetime of that function call. Now it's just gone. Now we modify the global variable x, but that has no effect on y. So when we get to the end of this script, then people were quite right. 20 is the value held in y. And if you didn't see why that was the case, I'd suggest taking Thani or something else. And like I've done here, to kind of step through it one step at a time. Even better, actually, before you step through it with Thani and you watch the computer do it for you, even better, write it down on paper, say, okay, I'm going to draw a little box here, which is my global variable x. And then when I get to this function call, I guess I better make another box over here, which is my local variable x, and step through it one step at a time, like Thani would do, but using the paper as the computer's memory. So you're going to execute each instruction as if you're the CPU, and you're going to use a piece of paper like it's the computer's memory. And that is a way that you can kind of step through and make sure that you're understanding what's going on. Okay, any questions about that? Questions about that question? No? All right, well, let's continue then talking about some new stuff. So last time we were together, we talked about local variables and we talked about global variables. Well, today we're gonna talk about keyword arguments. So a, a particularly special kind of argument associated with function calls. We're gonna talk about default arguments, which are also particular things related to the way that we call functions and how parameters can have default arguments associated with them. And then we're gonna talk about a fun thing called recursion, and then we'll close it off for the week. So remember, we are talking about arguments and parameters, and, and uh, could somebody write in the chat, what is the difference between 
an argument and a parameter. I know I keep kind of harping on this over and over, but it, it is an important distinction to understand. Um, and it's not clear to me that 100% of us quite get the distinction yet. All right, so we've got people typing in the chat. That's great. Tell you what, while you're typing in the chat, let me present a top hat question. Okay, so an argument is, <laughs> yeah, there we go. So the argument is the bread and the parameter is the toaster. Good. Or if we want to be slightly more specific even, the argument is the bread and the parameter is the toaster slot. So maybe you have a toaster that takes two pieces of bread or can accept four pieces of bread. So you might have a different number of slots in your toaster. If we can stretch the analogy just a little bit further, every analogy is imperfect. Um, some are more imperfect than others. The ones that I tend to come up with are quite imperfect. Um, my wife is the queen of analogies. Like she, yeah, she just distills things down and has the perfect analogy to the point where we jokingly call her the analogy police because my analogies are not quite as good and she'll call me on it. But anyway, we have fun. Um, so yeah, an argument is the bread parameters like the toaster slots. Uh, so an argument is a value and a parameter is a variable. Yes, that is another good distinction to have in those things. Uh, arguments are passed into a function, so they're values we pass into a function. Um, parameters are initialized by arguments. Yes. Good. Arguments are values you pass to a function in a function call. Yep. Meanwhile, parameters are used while defining the function. Yes. So parameters are local variables that get defined or that get initialized by whatever arguments get passed in. Oh, and I've uh, got a, a police officer emoji. So very good. Very good. Okay. In the meantime, so uh, and I hope you enjoyed that little uh, analogy. And since this is this is a public YouTube video, so uh, perhaps I'll have to point her at the thing where I, I told everybody in the world that uh, she's the analogy police. I think she wouldn't mind. In fact, I'm very confident, otherwise I wouldn't have said it. <laughs> One shouldn't say things about people that you don't think they would mind being said on the internet. Okay, so we've got some answers coming in to this question. Let's give it another few seconds for more answers. So I'm looking for how many arguments appear in this Python script the total number of arguments. So not just in one place, but throughout the whole script, how many arguments do we see? Now look here, I came here for a good argument. No, you didn't, you came here for an argument. That is the argument sketch from Monty Python, which if you haven't seen it, is amusing, and you should watch it. All right, more answers are coming in, but we still have, uh, let's give this just a little bit more time. And you can see, as I scroll up and down, there's nothing up my sleeve, like the magician said. So there are no additional lines in this script that I've forgotten about. I did fix um, an issue in one of the questions from last time when the answer that was asked for was not quite the right one. Uh, I think there's still one more that I need to change. So if you're panicking about why you lost that 0.5 or 0 0.5, those 0 0.5 marks, not that, those 0 0.5 marks, then uh, don't worry, I, I will fix that. All right, I'm going to close this in just a few more seconds. Let's give it another, say, five, four, three, two, one, and we'll close it out. So let's have a look at the answers. Okay, we had a few different answers. Well, let's try to count how many arguments. Oh, sorry, I didn't scroll there so that you could see that. We had a few different answers that came in. So let's look for all the arguments. So let's see, anything inside of parentheses. Let's have a look there. S, is that an argument? Is S an argument? Now remember, if you're nodding or shaking your head, I can't see you. <laughs> I don't know how many of you are in 2006, but I'm not. So uh, correct, it is not an argument. That's a parameter. That's a parameter. Character here is not an argument. 
S is not an argument. These are operands to an operator where the operator is in. So if I say A plus B, A and B are operands, plus is the operator. If I say a, if I say uh, S plus character, well, that's adding a string to another string, so that's great. We can add those together. If I say character in S, in is the operator. Character in S are operands. Those are not arguments. Okay. On the next line, name is equal to, or name is assigned by, input what is your name. So what is your name here? That's an argument. So we've got one. That is an argument to the input function. It is a value that we are passing in to input. Then we have this call to the contains function. So name, that's another argument. E, that's another argument. So we're passing two different arguments in here. So we've got one here, plus one, plus one. Then we have, well, what, how many other arguments do we see? So name is being passed to the print function. So print here is accepting two arguments, name and has at least two, one E, so that's another two, so that's up to five, and now I can't count on one hand anymore, or can I? Let's count in binary instead. So we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, and now I've got the final print call. Well, and I'll show you how to do this later. My nine-year-old loves counting in binary because you can get to 31 on one hand and you can get up to 1,023 on your two hands, which is fantastic. Um, and then we have the final call to the final print function, which again is two arguments. So that's another one, two, so that's seven. Seven arguments in total. So it looks like some folks missed on one or another or something else. But if we were to count all the arguments here, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Okay, so uh, we had been talking about arguments and parameters, and people gave us some pretty good definitions or uh, distinctions between arguments and parameters. And I do love to ask a question. I, I don't ask it as much as I used to in 1020 because... Uh, well, there are a lot of people writing the exams, but I do love to ask students, what is the key, essential, most important difference between this concept and that concept? Because it shows that it's not just that you are able to like regurgitate, regurgitate a definition for each one. It also shows that you have some kind of understanding about what's important about the differences between the two. So I love that kind of question. Unfortunately, it takes forever to mark if I've got a thousand of those questions on a final exam that I have to mark. That takes forever, even with TA help. So eh, I do less of that, but we'll see. Maybe it'll make a bit of a comeback on the final. We'll see. Um... So let's see, there was a question here. Why is something a return value, not an argument? So an argument is a value that you pass into a function that is received by an, a parameter that is, that is used to initialize a parameter. And so the operand of the return statement, that, that's not an argument. If I have A plus B, A and B are not arguments. They're operands of an operator. They're not arguments. Arguments are only those things that we pass in to a function, those values that we pass into a function as input. Okay, so we talked about... Um, arguments and parameters, and we talked about variables and variable scope, right? So remember, parameters are variables, and variables are local to a function call. So they have separate memory from other variables. In the example that I've got here, uh, we have an x here, we have an x there, we have an x there, and they're all different x's. And in fact, it would be, uh, I'm not going to assign this as a top hat question, but something that would be really good for you to do is to take this little example that I have here, and you can go back to it in the notes later, it's available on the course website, but to take this little example that I have here and figure out what this is going to print by walking through step by step. And this is very much the kind of thing that we would probably do a lot of on, say, a final exam. Here is a little Python program that uses a bunch of concepts that you're, you ought to know because you're familiar with them and you've used them a bunch. Now, can you step through it and figure out what it does? That kind of thing. So those variables, this x and this x and this x, they all have separate memory 
and they can have separate values in them. And remember, they are even separate between function calls. So it's not like, uh, it's not like this x is attached to the bar function in the sense that every time you call bar, x has the same value. No, the whole point of a parameter is to be different every time you call a function, or that it can be different. If I write a function called square root, I don't really want to have a square root function that can only calculate the square root of one number, right? Every time I call the square root function, I might pass in a different argument. And so these, um, these parameters can have different values and all local variables in a function, they're not just local to a function, they are local to a function call. And that is an important idea, which will really, and again, I'm reiterating this, but if we don't get clear on that, the recursion that we talk about at the end of this, um, at the end of this lecture, I almost said episode, <laughs> the recursion that we talk about at the end of this lecture will make even less sense. So we said that local variables are local. If you want to access a global variable, so if we wanted to have a script in which inside the foo function, when we modify the value of x, we don't want to modify the a local variable called x, and still instead we want to modify this global variable called x. We can do that with the global keyword, but that is something that really shouldn't turn up in our code very often because global variables, they have very limited use. All right, so uh, that's a little bit of review of some of those important ideas, but now let's talk about some new things. So uh, the first one is going to be keyword arguments. So we'll talk about keyword arguments and default arguments and then recursion. Um, actually, sorry, before we do, any questions about the things that we've talked about thus far? If you have questions, please ask, because I'm sure that if you have a question, there's probably another five people in the class who have the same question, um, but they're just not sure if they want to ask it. Well, I'm not seeing anything. In oh, no, I am seeing a little typing in the chat. Let's let that typing come to its logical conclusion. Boy, I miss being able to just let somebody talk, put their hand up and then talk. Uh, I can do that now in term eight and it is super helpful. I can actually see by the looks on people's faces whether I'm going too fast or too slow because I can see how well they're getting it, etc. Uh, can you please repeat the parameter, argument, and function call? Sure. So a parameter would be one of these things. So it's a local variable that is initialized by an argument in a function call. So a function call is when you write the name of a function, and then in parentheses, you put some arguments and say, hey, I want to call that function, and I want to call it with these values. So take these values and put them as inputs into the function. Take this English muffin and this piece of toast and put it into the two slots that have been, well, this half an English muffin, I guess, and this piece of bread and put them into the two slots that have been provided for our toasting machine. And then the toasting machine will do its thing. And it will receive the values I pass in. So a call has arguments and we pass those arguments into the function. Then the function does its work, and it receives those arguments and sticks them into its parameters. And those parameters will then be local variables inside the function that hold values. The values they start with are the values passed as arguments. Uh, can I repeat the slide after this one, the one about global variables? Sure. Uh, so we had an example last time where we didn't have this global x and then we added it. So if the global x was not there, let me highlight and pretend it's not there, then in when I call the foo function, which x is assigned to by this statement? x is assigned by 13. If there is no global x, when we say x is assigned by 13, which x do we mean? Do we mean this x, which is the global variable, or do we mean a local x that is inside of that function? Right, we mean a local variable. So let me see. 
Um, yeah, actually, let's just do this. Uh, so if I run this program, and I'm going to leave out the global X part. So I will run this script. Let's, uh, let's execute this statement, which assigns 12 to a global variable called X. Then we'll define this function called foo. Then we'll call foo. When we do that, we step into the foo function. Oops. In this program, I don't have a parameter in foo. Let's try that again. Okay, so we define a variable called x, we define uh, the foo function, now I'm going to step into that foo function. And so now we're running the foo function, when we hit this statement, x is assigned by 13. That's not going to assign to this global x, it's going to create a local variable inside the function, unless otherwise specified, whenever you create a, a variable inside of a Python function, it is always a local variable. And then it disappeared really quickly. Let me see if I can run that a little more slowly. So we'll take 13, we'll assign it into a local variable called x, but that had no effect on this global variable called x. If we want to change the behavior of that program, we can. We can say, dear Python, inside of this function, when I use the name x. I'm not referring to a local variable. I don't want you creating any local variables called x. I want to be referring to the global variable called x. So we can run this program. We'll define x to be equal to 12, define this function. Now when we call this function, we step into the function. We say, hey, Python, remember, I want the global x. And now you'll see when we assign the value 13 into x, the x that it gets assigned to is indeed the global x which means that when this program is done, the value contained in x is 13 instead of 12. So it's a different behavior. Okay, so hopefully that's helpful. All right, so now let's start talking about a couple of new things. Uh, so the first is going to be keyword arguments. So let me ask you a question. Um, first of all, have you used the RGB LCD color function? in the lab yet in order to turn on the backlight of a an LCD screen? I think you have, or at least I think you've used that LCD screen. I don't know, um, an LCD screen that looks like this. Okay, someone says you'll be doing that today. All right, very good. So yeah, in our labs, one thing that we can do and I should probably not stop and take the time to plug this in and actually do it. That doesn't seem to be stopping me. Uh, no, okay, I will stop. Um, well, I'll see if I can do two things at the same time, actually. So in this, um, in this function, we use this function to set the color of the backlight of an RGB LCD screen. So what color am I asking the screen to display here? Do you know? Uh, you don't have to know. If you don't know, then that, that's absolutely fine. But if you've played with colors and things before, um, then, then you might know. So what do you think? Does anybody know what color I'm being, I'm asking it? Yeah, there we go. I'm asking it to display purple or violet, depending on how you want to call it. Um, and so that is because it's an RGB LCD screen, meaning red, green, and blue. And 255 is the maximum amount of color that we assign in this color space. So we're saying we want the maximum amount of red, zero is the minimum amount of green, and 255 is the maximum amount of blue. So this is called 24-bit true color because you can have numbers that range from zero to 255 for each of those three colors, red, green, and blue. And with those, you can turn on different colors. Okay, um, it would be a little bit easier to tell what it is that we're actually asking the computer to do if we do something like this. So this is equivalent to the previous function call. So I showed a function call that says RGB LCD color. I'm going to pass you three arguments. One is 255, the next one is zero, and the next one is 255. And if you know that the arguments are supposed to go into parameters called red, green, and blue, 
then this is pretty clear. The fact that it's an RGB LCD color helps. The fact that when people are talking about color on a computer, they're almost always talking about red, green, and blue in that order, that helps. But it's even clearer if we specify explicitly Dear RGB LCD color, I want you to take the argument 255 and put it in your red parameter. I want to take zero and put it in your green parameter. I want to take 255 and put it in your blue parameter. So now it's even more explicit. And so it's even easier for somebody who's reading your code to tell what it is that you actually mean. And in some cases, it is necessary to use keyword arguments. Um, one important rule, actually no, before we get to the important rule, I think, yeah, before we get to the important rule, let me mention that we have used functions that um, can accept keyword arguments. Well, kind of any function can accept a keyword argument. If you have a function with a parameter called x, you can call it by saying foo of x is equal to something. Um, but an example of a function that uses keyword arguments that you can only really use as keyword arguments is our print function. Someone says blue is my favorite color. Yeah, mine too. Sorry, I didn't just disappear because blue is your favorite color. I was looking for a chord because I am trying to do two things at the same time and see if I can't uh, turn on this LCD screen, but a cable had fallen down, so I couldn't do that. Um, but you'll notice that in this print function, we have values that we can pass in, and this dot, dot, dot just means we can pass in more values. So if I want to, I can print one, two, and three, or one, two, three, four, five, six. I can print however many values I like. And there are a couple of things to note here. One is that there's always a space between these values, right? Um, and for some students, when I notice you're doing like assignment two, um, you wanted to print out the five boxes, but you didn't want to have a space in between them. So there are different ways you could do that. You could, for example, have a string which contains, now I'm not going to copy and paste the boxes right now because Thani doesn't like that stuff. I'll use an exclamation mark. So you could have a string called S and then you could say S plus equals another of those things that I want. Okay, now I've got a string that has five, those aren't exclamation marks, asterisks. <laughs> not enough coffee yet today. Um, or not enough sleep yet this term, or the previous term, or the one before that, or past two years, really. How are you all doing? Anyway, sorry. Um, so that's one way you could build that string. Um, but it is actually also possible to tell the print function, actually, I don't want you to put a space. Now, you didn't have to know this to do this because there was another way to do it. And in general, in these assignments, you should be able to do the assignments using only the things that I've taught you. You don't have to go off and learn other things about Python in order to do an exercise or an assignment. You don't have to go find somebody's YouTube channel where they like teach you things that you haven't learned yet or in a different order. Or maybe you find it confusing. Maybe you find it helpful. That's fine. If you want to read other books or you know, look at other people's teaching, that's fine. But you shouldn't have to. You should be able to do what we're doing using only the tools that I've given you in this course thus far. I'll never give you an assignment that you can't do with the things that I've taught you. So that was fine. But another way we could do this is, well, when we look at help for the print function, you'll see it has other parameters. So it has value. It has a value parameter. And the dot, dot, dot means you can have more of that. But then there are these other parameters that you could access using keyword arguments. So one is called sep. And sep is the separator between the things that the print function prints out. So if I wanted to print one, two, and three, well, normally I get a space between it. If I didn't want a separator, I could specify sep is the empty string. And now it just prints one, two, three. Or if I wanted my separator to be as well as, now it prints one as well as two as well as three. Something else that we can see in the print function that's quite handy, um, there's an end parameter as well. And by default, it is this 
backslash n character. Now that's a special character that means a new line. So it's like if you're typing on a typewriter and then you hit the carriage return and tap, 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 and then you hit the carriage return and well, that moves things to the next line and also returns the carriage from one end to the other. Um, and so backslash n, the new line character, does that when we are printing things. If I wanted to, I could print one backslash n, backslash n, backslash n, backslash n, two, and this will print one with some new lines in between it. The print, um, the print function by default will put a new line at the end of anything you print. So in this program, if I want to print one, two, three, then I want to print four, five, six, by default, that will print one, two, three on one line and four, five, six on another line. If I don't want a new line between them though, I can specify that end should be something else, like as well as, so be, now we'll print one, two, three, as well as four, five, six, or I could make it be a colon. So now it prints one, two, three, colon, four, five, six. I could make it be an empty string. So it's just one, two, three, four, five, six. If I make the sep be an empty string for both of these, or let's just do one of them, you'll see one, two, three, four, five, six. So end uh, changes the character that's printed or the string that's printed at the end of all the values you want to print out. So print can print's behavior can be customized using sep and end. But you notice, because print takes as many arguments as we want to pass it, the only way that we can control the separator and the end is using keyword arguments. Because there's no way to write enough regular arguments. These are called positional arguments because which parameter they get passed to depends on their position, their order. There's no way to write enough arguments to eventually get to sep or end. You can write absolutely as many arguments as you like here. The only way to control the separator and the end is by using keyword arguments. So we have positional arguments are the arguments that we don't specify a keyword for. We don't specify the parameter name that we want those arguments to go into. We just say, okay, put this one in the first argument and put this in, or sorry, put this argument in the first parameter, put this argument in the next parameter, put this argument in the next parameter, put this argument in the next parameter. But if we want to, we can specify, please take this argument and pass it to this parameter. Please take this argument and pass it to this parameter and identify those parameters by name. Now there is one important syntax rule that we need to know. Um, but before that, let me ask you another top hat question. We'll get to that right after the break. First, an important message from our sponsor. So what will this print? And this is one of these instances where I'm going to ask you to type exactly what will be printed. So no extra stuff. Just tell me exactly, character for character, what this will print when we run this little two-line Python script. Ah, and there we go. And in the meantime, in the background, ta-da, see, the screen is indeed purple. Somebody give me a triple of a different color combination that you would like. So three numbers that range between zero and 255. Somebody said they like blue. Maybe you could tell me what would the correct color triple be that would give you a nice blue. Only do that after you finish the top hat question.
Boy, that's hot. <laughs> this is the point where I give product placement. See? This brand of coffee mug keeps your coffee hot. I'm not actually paid for product placement. Not even promotional consideration. All right, people are almost done answering this question. So while you're, while other people are finishing answering the question, if you're already done, why don't you type in a combination of three numbers between 0 and 255, and we'll see what color it gives us. Okay, so someone wants to see how about zero zero two fifty five. Yes, well, somebody said they did like blue, and ta-da! All right, now we've got another request that somebody said. How about forty five twenty three eighty eight? Ah, oh, yeah, that's a very nice kind of a, more of a muted sort of blue. That's cool. Uh, I will definitely not get to all of these, but 357, 187. Hmm, yeah, yeah, that's a nice, almost like a royal blue. All right, that's cool. Um, okay, we've got 0, 128, 128 is being suggested as a nice teal. Yeah, that is a nice teal color. Cool. Okay. Um, and also, we could do this differently. Like, I, we could put these things, we could pass different values to different parameters. We don't have to use the same order. So when we use keyword arguments, we could say RGBLCD where blue is zero, uh, green is 128, and red is 128. And what's that going to give us? Well, it's going to give us kind of a yellow. It's slightly greenish yellow, but I think that's just because of the uh, the green component behind the LCD. It, it's kind of yellow, right? So we can pass these arguments even in a different order when we're using keyword arguments, which is pretty cool. Wish we could see true cyan. Ah, yes. Well, um... And of course, thinking about color design is it's very important in terms of aesthetic appeal and making systems that are pleasant for people to use because you want you don't want to build systems that make your users want to poke their eyes out. Um, but also, color theory is really important when it comes to things like accessibility, as I mentioned last time. Okay, so most people have answered now, and so let's go ahead and close this question and let's have a look at people's responses. And yeah, there we go. So the... The majority, I think it is in fact a majority, hooray, had it exactly right, uh, which is it will print one, two, three with, oh, sorry, <laughs> it'll print one times two times three space plus space four times five times six. Now, the issue that we're seeing here. Um, and you see weird things going on with like italicization and stuff. So Top Hat uses... Uh, asterisks to allow you to specify that something should be in italics or bold so it's not actually showing those things properly but yes there we go so one asterisk two asterisk three so the asterisks around the two so that's why it doesn't show up properly in top hat space plus space four asterisk five asterisk six so this is a sum of products one times two times three plus four times five times six good cool all right, so there is one important rule um, that we do need to mention when we are thinking about keyword arguments. So we said that there are positional arguments and there are keyword arguments, and you cannot use positional arguments after keyword arguments. So if you're going to have keyword arguments, and that's a fine thing to do, we can print one, two, three, and say that the sep should be an asterisk. Cool. Uh, what we cannot do is say one, two, three, sep equals star four, five, six. We are never allowed to have positional arguments after the first keyword argument. Now, why is that? Well, positional arguments rely on the order that you pass things in. If you have a function that takes five parameters, well, you have to put five arguments into it. But if you say, I'm going to pass you this argument 
and this argument, and then a couple of keyword arguments, and then this argument, well, how would you know where the last one is supposed to go? We could get confused about the order and be unclear about the order, and different people might think, well, I think this one should go here, or I think that one should go there. We don't want that kind of confusion. So instead, there's just a rule that says no positional arguments after the first keyword argument. And so that's a syntactic rule that is quite important. Someone says, please show us how to print variables with a separator. Uh, yeah, I, I just did. So um, if I say print three values, one, two, three, with a sep of star, it'll print one times two times, three, well, one asterisk two asterisk three. Um, this is just a string that's being printed out, so it doesn't actually mean math or anything. Okay, so those are keyword arguments, and there's also default arguments. And the way default arguments work is that when you're defining a function, you can say, I want to, or I have a parameter, and I want to allow whoever calls this function to pass in an argument, but if they don't pass in an argument, this is what I'm going to use instead. And we also saw that with our print function. So if I look at help for print, you'll see it says that sep is assigned by a space end is assigned by backslash n. So that means that if I don't pass in an argument, this is the default value that that parameter will receive. So we could do that here where we could say uh, def foo of x and then return. So let's see, make twice as big. That's a terrible function name. It's very long. And, but on the other hand, the word double is something that might confuse people because that's also the name of a type in some programming languages, not Python. Um, but I'm going to return two times x. Well, if I want it, so let's see. I'm going to print what is the result of calling make twice as big with the number two. Well, so that's going to print four. Um, but if I wanted to, I could specify a default value and say, if you don't tell me what x is, then I'm just going to use the number one as the default argument. And so now I can call the make twice as big function with no arguments at all, and it'll print the number two. If I didn't have that default argument, this would be an error. You see, we get this error that says, hey, we are missing one positional argument. There's a, there's a parameter called x, and you didn't give it an argument. You're supposed to give it an argument. But with a default value, that is not the case. So for a function like this, maybe that doesn't make so much sense. But for a function like help, well, it makes all the sense in the world because we would quite like to have a sensible default that when I print a bunch of values, if I don't tell you what the separator is, just pick something sensible like the space character. So uh, the default argument is, is passed into the parameter if we don't supply an argument in the call. And oh, <laughs> look at that. How clever to have some stuff about the print function. <clears throat> um, so you can see here that we can print things by saying here uh, all of these that these words go on one line and these words go on the next line. But I could also pass arguments to the sep parameter explicitly and the n parameter explicitly. If I don't, then they get their default values. Here I have a print where I've passed a value to sep. I didn't pass anything to n, which means that n gets its default value. Uh, someone says, does sep work with strings? Uh, yes, so you can print any type of value you like, absolutely any type of value. And sep is a string that will be printed between those values. Okay, finally, one last concept, which is something called recursion. And this is when a function calls itself. Now, you might say that sounds kind of weird, but there are lots of instances in which, in fact, uh, recursion is a really, really elegant way to express a solution to an interesting problem. We're not going to do a whole lot of that stuff in this course. Um, when you get to data structures and algorithms in term four, if you do computer engineering, recursion is extremely useful, used all over the place. Um, but it is an important idea in computing that everybody who knows anything about programming should be familiar with the idea and be able to look at you know, a recursive function on a final exam and tell me what it does, possibly by stepping through it step by step.
So for example, we've talked about the factorial before, right? So a factorial is something that the factorial of n is defined in terms of the factorial of n minus 1. So instead of having a loop that computes a factorial, we could also have a recursive definition where we say, well, we're going to have a factorial function. You pass it an input n, and it will take n times whatever the factorial of n minus 1 is. So that's a pretty elegant solution, right? Remember, every function call has its own variables. So if I have a function like factorial of n, and then I return n times factorial of n minus 1, and I want to calculate the factorial of 5, say, well, we can run this, and so I'm going to define that factorial function. Oh, and I'm going to put Thani up. Uh, and now I'm going to call that factorial function and pass 5 into factorial. And what happens when I do? Well, we have a factorial function with n being equal to 5. So we're going to compute what is 5 times the factorial of n minus 1. So that means what is the factorial of 4? Well, let's call the factorial function. And look, we get another window that pops up. And if I keep doing this, you'll see then we'll have 4 times factorial of 3, 3 times the factorial of 2, 2 times the factorial of 1. And all of these function calls are sort of all happening at the same time. So 1 kicks off another one, which kicks off another one, which kicks off another one. And the first one is not done until everything inside of that function call is done. So there's a, there, this is kind of a cool way of describing a problem and letting the computer figure out the complexity of how to actually do the calculations. Um, so remember, every call has its own variables, which means that this function's n is different from that call function calls n, which is different from that function calls n, which is different from that function calls n. These are all separate places in memory. And that's what lets us do this whole factorial thing. So each call has its own variables, but there's a problem with this code, as I've shown it here. And that is a problem that, because now it's time to, to go, I will let you look and try to figure out what is the problem here. Oops, I'm giving something away. Um, but take a look at this function, and then try to step through it, not, not in Thani or in Visual Studio Code or something, but by hand, just walk through, okay, what's gonna happen when I try to find the factorial of five? And what is the problem here? And that's something that we can then use to start our discussion on Monday. Okay, uh, so yeah, yeah, some people are putting good answers in already. Don't give the game away completely though, because some I'd, I'd like uh, if you haven't spotted the issue yet, I'd like people to uh, to go through it by hand, and and hopefully that'll help them figure it out. So uh, that's it for the lecture content today. Uh, I've already made the announcement about assignment two. You can submit late, um, and that's up until six o'clock today. But if you need a little extra time because you were kind of blindsided by the announcement I made on Wednesday and the announcement today, then just let me know. I've almost, but not quite, caught up on my 1020 email. I still have a few assignment one 1020 emails that I need to respond to. And in particular, there are a few people who didn't use exactly the right prompt. It's not a large number of people. So rather than me fixing the auto grader, which to be honest is going to take a little while because I have to get to it first and I've got other things that are like more immediately pressing. Um, if you're someone who the problem with your assignment one was that you used slightly the wrong prompt, like you say, input a five letter word and didn't have a hyphen in the five letter part or something like that, something really, really small like that, and that cost you a whole bunch of marks, then fix that that just that little thing and email me your updated code and I can resubmit it for you because you know, I maybe I would have been a little bit stricter about this if I'd gotten back to you right away, but given that it's been a couple of weeks for some of you and I still haven't responded, I'll be more lenient. So just send me your fixed code. I will upload it for you and we'll see what that new version gets because I don't want anybody to be penalized 19 out of 20 marks just because they made one trivial error if the rest of their code actually works. So just send me your updated version. Uh, but in the future, please remember, 
that you can submit as many times as you like up to the deadline. And part of the goal there is to help you catch those little tiny errors that get in the way of your code actually showing off what it can really do. So for the future, I'm going to be a bit stricter. For assignment one, I'll be a little more lenient. So just email me your updated code. Okay. Uh, question in the chat. Any word on resubmitting assignment one? Excellent point. I should bring that. Yes. So uh, I guess I just didn't see that that question came up before I answered it. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions come up in the chat. So I guess we will call it a day. And uh, I hope you all have a very nice weekend. Bye.